Hi, I'm Adam, this is Stu, we're Geist, and today we're going to talk to you about our track Mind, which uh, recently got signed to uh, Elevate, Pig and Dan's label. We're going to talk to you about how we created some of the sounds, talk to you a little about the arrange and how we came across uh, some of the key parts in the track. Hopefully we're going to touch on a few elements of how we produce as well, try not to confuse you guys too much. We try and keep it all really fun, as you'll see, um, so let's get into it. Kicks for us is where we uh, always kind of like to start. Get a nice full sounding kick. This has actually come from a sample pack, which we do use samples. They're to be used. And we're, you know, not afraid of saying that that's what we use. Um, so if we just solo this kick here. Yeah, the reason we liked this kick initially um, was because it, if you listen in the background, it, it's got a little bit of a history. It's got some element. You can quite clearly see that as a sample, it's been drawn from an existing track. And that allowed us to initially have a groove straight away so that we could stop bringing other bits of percussion in. And it, it facilitates us in getting from point A, which is a complete blank canvas, and get rolling. And fundamentally, as we mention a lot, it has to be fun for us. So to get into a track that has a bit of something to it already for us to enjoy it, and to get using the Ableton pushes and start dropping things in and out, is uh, I think it's important. So, uh, you know, before we start really concentrating on big elements like your synths and stuff like that, percussion is where we go in. I think in techno as well, um, a big kick, uh, especially when you've got the EQ kick as well, when you bring in coming in out of a drop, all that energy that you can create on a dance floor from just a kick is really important. And obviously being on a dance floor quite often, it's it really is important for us to just get that oof. You know, that real beans feeling. So that's why we, always, we, we get a good feeling about a, a, a kick. The track does flow, doesn't it? It yeah. really gathers momentum quite kick, uh, quick. We can sit for quite a while sometimes, kick, no, no. And then we both just go, yes, that's the one, throw it in. And then it's a good thing about Ableton. You can literally just start throwing things in, getting everything rolling on a nice big loop. And yeah, you know, we kind of go from, go from there. Yeah, we initially intended to get rid of this kick, like we said, but when it got to the point of, if I just drop it back in, with everything, it has a real feel to it that when you pull it out, it loses something, loses a little bit of an element. And to go back on in the slower, you can hear, in, just in the background, you can really hear there's that muffled stuff going off there and we really liked it. So much to the dismay of our mix engineer, we kept a kick with a lot of hiss and noise on and pairing up that with the bass was real hard work, but again, worth it in the end as this track really turned out exactly how we wanted it. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, so to touch on the processing that we've got going on down here at the bottom, obviously we use just the straight up EQ8 from Ableton to give us a sculpting aspect of where we wanted our kick. Now, obviously this will change later and go into a lot more detail when we start pairing it with our bass. And that is very much in the mix down section of it. Again, falling back on our enjoyment, we do tend to move along really quickly to keep the enthusiasm there. And then we can revisit the elements and polish them to where they need to fit. So that being said, we always like to put a side chain on it um, just for the elements of where it needs to be, um, ducking down and giving space to other things. We do like our kick to cut through but obviously there is importance of remembering that a thunderous kick sometimes eats up headroom everywhere else. So with that being said, we have on this one we have um, two compressors. Now, do excuse the uh, strange naming of different tracks, we never really know what to call stuff when we're going through it, so we get a little bit creative. But on this one, later on in the track, there is an element that we feel needed some real space in the mix. So we actually sidechain quite a few things against it just to be, just to be drawn down to give that element um, all the space it needs and we think it works. Again, not something you see on a kick very often, um, a delay. Now, um, you have to be careful where you place your delay or with a kick because it's such a wide element. But we just tailed off a few elements. I mean, if I can pull up where we were with it. Let's have a quick look. We, um, we only use it very, very subtly, just on the ends, just to allow things to roll through. Now, not a lot of people would ever really implement a delay on a kick because it gets a bit too wavy, but I will emphasize that it's a very, very subtle amount. It's not a lot at all. Um, and that being said, when you put that with the compression and the EQ curves that you're gonna put on these, it, it does sit really well, or so we think anyway. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. This one ducking down quite frequently, you wouldn't normally assume on a kick drum, but as we've mentioned before, it's not just a pure kick. It's a sample and it does have some other stuff in the background. So if we were to turn this one off, You've got a lot of, there's, there's some boom that rolls through after it that we wanted to keep, but 
there's also that sort of like it's kind of like a, a muffled sort of hi hat like that it's just catching yeah. the tail off um, because this kick's just rolling around on a singular loop. So when we add the compression to it, it just pulls it back down just a little bit, which gives space to our actual percussion. We didn't want to lose all of it, which is why it's only very, very sort of minute amount of compression on there, but it was just enough for our other hats to really pull through. So bass normally comes next. Some of his latest tracks, which we're working on literally this week, um, just gone for a very boomy kick, a massive kick, which hasn't got any bass. Um, now, as you can hear, this kick is pretty big anyway, so this bass isn't actually Solo up both the a, a full a full bass. Now, if you have a listen to it, it's not it's not a it's not a really big you know your your, um, your techno on off bass. It's more of a an atmospheric, almost like a, a paddy bass. It's got a low just, rumble. Yeah, to it, like hasn't a, it? just rumbles through. It's not as in your face. I think the kick carries it through. It's more of like a something just underneath in the mix. Yeah, if I put a spectrum analyzer on it just now down here to show you where we're at, this gives you a picture of where the bass is sitting. Now, it does have sort of high up elements that come above 100, but obviously the main sort of weight of the track is sat right down here. And so obviously we've already queued out the section where our kick wants to sit. Um, we've not ducked it too much because again, we use side chain compression on it, which you can see on the bottom right there, we've got the two side chains running. Um, when you pair it up with the kick, they sit quite well, the kick cuts through, and then obviously the bass comes rolling in just there. Uh, it's a relatively simple bass. We used uh, everybody's age classic, Silence there. Um, we, when creating this bass, it was more of an element to complement the kick sample that we'd already got. So we were sort of going down the route of, we have a kick that we may get rid of later, so let's not focus too much on the bass yet. I mean, we were going to go with a percussive left track. I think we even said out, as well that we we're just going to have the, the kick, which was had it like, the, like I said, the boomy kick. And I think this bass, even though it's kind of second in the range, I think it, it was like an afterthought. We like the, the emptiness of just the kick and that like slight percussion and the hiss that we spoke about. I think the bass just brings it all together. So yeah. On right on cue it to <laughs> comes back in. <laughs> uh, so carrying on with the bass, um, there's not really too much to say about it in the sense of we didn't feel that we were going to get cre too creative with it because it was an element that we were going to move on from. But we, we kind of, as as it sort of evolved, the bass just kind of remained a constant. That's yeah, there's no modulation or anything. No. It, it just stays just rumbling through all the way through. At the end of the day, it's a bass. It's not a synth. It's not a, you know, it doesn't need to wind up on the filters or anything like that. It is just there for bass, really. Technically explained. It's just there for bass, well done, Adam. <laughs> to explain the side chain on the bass, uh, we run off a side chain signal that we have running pretty much constantly throughout the whole track. Um, again, we're using two different side chains. The one I previously explained before was to give one particular element space in the mix. The sort of stock side chain, so to speak, is um, the kick signature. Uh, we haven't really changed the signature of the kick at all. We're using an audio signature rather than a MIDI signature or anything like that. Uh, it's quite aggressively side chained. If we listen to just the bass by itself, it, it ducks quite a lot. If you take the side chain off of it, you've got more of a straightforward drone tone that just runs through, which I think when you switch the side chain compression, now, I think as well, doesn't it? Yeah, you put the compression on, gives it a little bit of groove to it. It's it's not an over the top bass, but when sat in with everything else, really fills the space that we wanted filling at that time. Yeah. Okay. To to explain the second side chain. Uh, we have a, a track in here called Held Grit, which you can hear in the background, it's just a stab sound. Now that sound, we wanted to really drive through everything. And rather than compress everything as a whole, or even compress all the groups, we've used individual sidechain compression from this element on most tracks, but all of the different balance. So it really pushes the bass back to give a, a large amount of space. But then when you come up into the hi-hats, it only just sort of tickles the hats back because I think they needed to continue to roll. So this element, while it's just a very, very short element, it uh, it doesn't come in too frequently. So when it does, we really wanted it to cut in the mix. So we move on then to the rest of our percussion. Um, percussion for us has always been an important part. Um, I, well, I think as we go through everything, we'll say that everything's an important part, but percussion for us allows us to really keep things driving. Um, so we very often in our percussion section, we'll use the Ableton pushers um, in the clip view and we'll add loops or we'll create things using the drum rolls, uh, drum racks in Ableton. 
we'll just throw a lot of stuff at it just to see what gels well together and then we'll use a more of a <coughs> subtractive approach to take out what we think is not working. At this stage as well, we'll begin to EQ things. So to move to the first hat, it's a 909 sample that we've thrown in there and we haven't really done a lot to it. We've maybe changed the sustain on it a little bit and the decay just to sort of get it exactly to the length and sound that we really want. And then just applied Ableton's inbuilt reverb, which we think is fantastic. We use a few other reverbs when we get to the mix down stage, but in our general creation, we think that this reverb offers everything that we need. Um, again, we're not using too much decay time because it's already a long enough element that we think can sit in there. So to just give you um, the open hat, it's uh, nothing too spectacular, but it's your standard 909 open hat. It's a stock thing for techno music and we absolutely love it. It's not a stock thing that we feel we have to use all the time. We just find that we put them in there and we never seem to take them out. They, they sit in very well. That combined with just a small amount of reverb, basically just the tiniest amount, which when in context of all the other elements, sits it right in the mix really where we want it. Uh, moving on to the next element, we have our shakers, which if I just bring them up for you and drop them on, we've bounced them into two channels. We've got one that is just run flat as it is right now. Now this was an element that initially I didn't really like. It's a little bit too, I'm not that into shakers, so to speak. Um, it's an egg shaker straight in from a percussion kit built in Ableton. It was something that Adam felt there was a space that could be filled. So we filled that space and then it developed to a little bit more. We've got some uh, compression running on it intermittently inside, uh, inside, the, rack. inside the rack itself. And then again, we have a reverb setting on it just to bring it out and open up the space around it. What we've also done is we've applied a delay to the same element in a different channel. Now the reason for it being in a different channel is it gives us more scope when we're thinking about compression or when we're thinking about EQing it. It's the same element but it's a lot wider, it's panning around a little bit. And with that, sometimes it kind of wanders off into different frequency bands that we may want to compress against. So along the rack down here, we've got the ping pong delay which is what we use. Now again, it's an inbuilt Ableton piece of equipment. We absolutely swear by it. It's one of the best delays that we use when it comes to an in-the-box delay. We very often like to run analog equipment in as well when we're really trying to mess with things. Where we were at in this stage of our production, we like to stay within the box. We have started using the, uh, the boss pedals and things like that as, just to give us a bit more scope to come off of the quantization and really sort of integrate how we play live to bring that element into our productions. But at this stage, we're in the box using it as it's sort of intended to be really and so that's the reason why it's in a different channel is for post-production. So moving further down the percussion we get to our rolling hat which hat two whatever you know whatever you want to call it in your section um, which, as you may notice the, the theme with our percussion for this track and with most of our stuff is the 909. It's something that both Adam and I are huge fans of and it can't sort of seem to go very wrong for us. You know, every track that we do, we add a 909, or Adam adds a 909, and it seems to find a home, doesn't it? Yeah, it I think 909, it is just, it is techno. 909 is known for being around techno a lot, and we do use it. I think all of our hi-hats are out of, well, all 909, I think. So, the rolling hats, I think it just brings a lot of groove. A nice lift as well, we use it in some open spaces. And I think it just brings, again, the track together. Yeah, I think it's worth mentioning at this stage that we, we have a balance between using 909 samples that we may have pulled off of our TR8 or whether we've pulled them from sample packs. I mean, in this case, it's, it's a sample pack 909. Yeah. Um, we also use Ableton's 909 built-in drum rack. It's very good, it has its limitations, but it does allow you to manipulate things a lot more. Um, as you can obviously see, we're massive ambassadors for using Ableton to its extremities when it comes to the creative side of stuff. We move away from it a lot largely when it comes to the mix down, but that's a complete separate kettle of fish, so, so to speak. Um, this rolling hat. Yeah, like I say, we've also got a running a side chain on the compressor, just giving it that bounce and that yeah. groove again. If I lift the compression off, it goes a lot more flat, just runs across. And then when you kind of just add the right amount of compression, starts to be in keeping with the groove. Now we haven't just thrown the same compressor on every single one. Um, we do try and give them all different amounts so that certain elements, when you have the percussion together, they, yeah, it starts to create a groove, really. Yeah. Uh, moving across to our ride section, 
which I don't believe we've got any in that loop, so let me pull it over here. Again, no surprise, we're in the realms of 909. It uh, just works, doesn't it, Fuzz? Yeah, for consistency <laughs> just, as well, our hats, obviously, as will yours be in your, in your productions, I assume, they all ultimately complement each other. And when you find a home with a 909 ride or a 909 hi-hat, it's very often you'll find that the rest of the stuff will follow suit, or that's how it works for us. Um, slightly less compression on this one, as we wanted the tail to run through. It's already quite a wet ride. It's got a decent amount of sustain to it, so... What, a lot of release as well? Yes. As it, a ride, or it'd just be a, a simple, straight, closed hat, really, if you closed all the release up. So, uh, yeah, we do use this element in the track to lift. So, as you notice in the range, it comes in after the main brake. I mean, it does run before as well, but it is used as a lift. And so, leaving it there in its purest sort of form, not messing with it too much, not adding too much or taking too much away, is where we thought it worked best. In some cases, as you may see in, uh, in the automation just down here, um, there's something on the release. It's something that we tried uh, and then decided to move away from. So I believe we'll have just sort of gone on a bit of a curve just to see if we can tighten it up as another element moves around. Um, it was obviously at this point something that we forgot to get rid of. So uh, again, it can be done, but we found that it wasn't necessary. That draws back to our sort of additive, subtractive sort of way of working. We will try a bunch of stuff and then we're not afraid to take it off. You know, nothing's set in stone until it gets sent to mastering. So you may notice underneath we have ride two. Fundamentally, exactly the same ride. We've just bounced it down into a different channel. And then what we've done is apply a reverb to this one. Now, it's not a reverb in the context of changing the sound for its initial fundamental. It's an element to transition the rest of the track into a break or out of a break in this case. Um, the reason we've put it in a different channel rather than doing it on the same one is because we have above it in the original channel a couple of little trills, but we wanted those to remain dry and really cut through. So here we've got the compression before the reverb, which is counterintuitive in some cases, but it's sent to work really well for us in the mix. So I believe uh, later on we actually moved that one around. The reverb was before, but the compression was ducking the tail on the reverb far too much. So. All we've done just on the end, if I take the loop off, is if you just catch the tail on the reverb, it takes it straight through. And we wanted to do that element so that we could use it as a separate channel rather than having to interfere. These two do sit over each other at the same time. So when it came to mixing, we did have to decide which elements sat the highest. Um, but it's sent to work in the end, really. As you can see in this part here, we're almost using the, uh, the ride almost as like a, a riser, like an effect, if a I'd sweep bring it into context with the rest of the track. So just listen. It comes from a straight ride, and then just gets, well, the decay time. It's quite wet as well. So it just fills that space. This is an element or something that we would do with um, the RV6, which is a boss pedal. We'd do that in our live sets. We'd open up the decay time, open up the dry wet, really start to fill the space. Um, but just with such a simple element, rather than it being such a huge element. And as you see at the end here, it just tails away to nothing just at the right time for everything else to come back in and take over. Like that. Okay, we good on that one. Uh, we move on now to our synth stab, as we've called it. Again, creative naming, not really our, our forte. Uh, this element is created within Silent, which we found a little bit of a spiritual home with the Silent on this track. We'd not used it a lot before, and we really found that there were some elements that came along really early and we stuck with it for the rest of the track, creating quite a few pieces. Um, in this case, uh, we have got, if I can just get the sound up for you guys to listen to, it's just some real cutting stabs, which when implemented into the rest of the track, pull you along into the next section and really, you find those elements are the parts where when you play them in a club, they're the bits that grab hold of people and really make them think, yes, something's coming now, this, is, this track's really got hold. Um, so. It's um, a not too technical sound really. We did find it as we were preset trolling, to be fair. We were just looking for something, a little element, something creative to give us a bit of uh, inspiration. Uh, Adam was jamming away on the keyboard and this is what came out. It took many forms to start with and then this is where we ended up. So um, I think we actually looked to use, if I get a bit of a loop going for you, because this is going to be quite difficult if you're not hearing it all the time. So jumping into our loop, the sound was quite 
flat to start with, so we had to push the mid range quite a bit. Um, the low mids sort of give the element of a sort of bassy sound, so to speak, but we still, in our minds, see it as a synth. So the elements that are right up here across where the percussion would be up the top, we cut them out because there was real harmonics that were sat up high that we didn't like. Um, we did have to put a utility on it. Now, the utility down here just gives us um, a stereo channel boost to push it right up to where we needed to be. Uh, later on in mix, we pull it back down a little bit and sit it there, but at this point, to keep the creativity flowing and the importance of a real driving element, it's just nice and high. We um, toyed with side tain compression, but it just didn't fit on that element. And so that's, in a nutshell, that particular element. I think as well, when we, when we come across a sound that we like, it's normally stop, sometimes tweak, tweak the filter slightly, decay resonance, but apart from that, if we like it, we kind of just, just roll with it. Yeah, there's been a lot of time and effort put into getting these presets to where they need to be. Having done a sample pack and stuff like that, we now know the importance and the time that people put into making these presets where you need to be to facilitate speed of production. Again, sometimes we go through tracks, throw in some presets, listen to stuff, and three or four of these will help create a different element. In this case, again, it was just something that stuck around. It was a much, much more higher resonating sound. It was much more acidy, but we managed to tune where we wanted to be, found the frequencies that we were at, and it just sits perfectly on our track. So again, one of Stu's favorite little uh, additives in a, uh, in a range is a, a reverse, which you can hear coming in now. Again, it just drags you from one section of the track into the next. It is just the same synth that we've just been showing you. It basically is just that sound, simply reversed, drags you into the next part of the track. Yeah, we do use it quite a lot. We use percussion uh, reversed, we use the synths reversed. We think it's just an element that helps progress, keeps you interested. Sometimes they're that subtle that you don't even know they're happening. It is as simple as bouncing an audio track, sampling it off with whatever automation that you've got running through it or whatever elements or plugins that you've got sat on top and then reverse it and see if it fits. Sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it's an element we'll spend five minutes tuning it and it won't work. But again, in this case, it's something we chose to stick with and it's one of my favorite elements in the track really. I don't know why it's only subtle, but it works. Again, you know, it's that, it's that good we haven't put any processing on it whatsoever. It's no. just clean. So all we did, create an audio track and then literally sampled straight in from the, uh, the silent there. We uh, apply absolutely nothing to it record it as a straight piece of audio over maybe one or two bars, depending on how long the tail is on the element. And then to go into it, very straightforward piece of audio. We, as it turns out, have not touched the gain level on it or anything at all, it just reversed it. So, I mean, to give you perspective of it the other way around, it's just the very last tail element. It's not all three of the notes, it's just the last tail element. And that, when flipped around and added to the other element gives you a real nice drag and it's something that you could maybe not be able to create within silent itself so using an audio stem and spinning it straight round it sounds like this okay guys sorry that's all we've got time for right now but if you want to see part two get the latest issue of computer music